Hello and welcome everyone to this invitation only session of the Island Finance Forum 2021, financing a blue green recovery for the Caribbean. Um, I think we have a few more people who will probably be joining over the next few minutes, but just briefly for those of you who don't, who have not used Remo before, uh, if you if you weren't in our networking session that just happened, this platform is slightly different uh, than Zoom. And the reason that we're using this is after we do our opening panel, and I'll be introducing our opening panelists shortly, we'll have an opportunity to meet each other, network, and have a bit more of a dynamic discussion than some of our other um, uh, panels that will be held throughout the, re the week. So thank you all so much uh, for being here. Uh, please note that this panel session will also be recorded and will be available to the wider audience of Island Finance Forum registrations. We've had close to 5,000 people register so far for the event and uh, from, from all over the world, from a really wide range of countries. And we'll also be holding a roundtable focused on the Pacific Islands uh, Wednesday or Thursday, depending on where you are, uh, Wednesday evening, my time, Thursday morning for most of the Pacific. Uh, would encourage you to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box to the right, um, just so we get an idea of the types of people who are here, where you're from, and what your interests are. And obviously, this topic of financing a blue-green uh, recovery is very important. And what does a blue-green recovery mean? Well, obviously, the last year has been very difficult for many islands around the world, especially the Caribbean. Um, and the issues of climate and environment are not completely separate to those issues. So I think it's important that we have this broader discussion of how this can be approached um, over the next uh, over the next 12 months and beyond. And obviously want to recognize that we're having this conversation while the eruption of La Soufriere in St. Vincent is ongoing and not just impacting horrendously many of the people on the island of St. Vincent, but as far away in Barbados, Grenada and other neighboring islands with that ashfall. Um, and so that has obviously got to be a key part of the context for this uh, discussion. Um, so I guess now I can invite our panelists to turn on their videos. And while they do that, um, I'll just say that, so the, the, the format for the rest of this session will be that for about the next uh, 45, 50 minutes, we'll have remarks from our distinguished panelists who are joining us from um, NGOs, government backgrounds, uh, international finance and private sector. It's quite an eclectic mix of, um, of angles to discuss this from. And then after that, we'll go into the second half of the session, which will be an opportunity for you to meet and talk with others um, in smaller groups on the tables and set you some small, uh, small challenges, I guess, to discuss which will lead into us voting on some of the solutions and ideas put forward at the end and being able to have a, um, have a broader, uh, broader discussion. And then at the end, there'll be time to move and, and talk to some of the people that maybe you have not yet. So this topic, financing a blue-green recovery, we're going to look at it from a variety of angles, including the blue part, the blue economy, and also the green part, which includes renewable energy, um, environmental preservation, and others as well. But obviously, the key part of this is the financing. And I, the reason that we put together the Island Finance Forum was we found that at a virtual island summit last year, there were all of these amazing solutions, ideas, directions that people wanted to go in, but often the financing is the critical component that was missing. And so we put this event together to bring in our sustainability and development holders with the wider finance holders that are included today. So just to introduce all of our speakers, and then we will ask each of them to do a seven minute or so address just to introduce their topic before going into the Q&A. We have Dr. Angus Friday, who is the Blue Economy Director of the Weight Institute and Grenada's uh, former ambassador to the United States. We have Christian Peter, who is the Practice Manager for the Environment, Natural Resources and Blue Economy Global Practice Unit at the World Bank. 
We have Gosda Kurosoy, who is head of banking and financing at MPC Capital, which works across the Caribbean and Latin America. And then we have Timar Jackson, who is the manager um, of origination and structuring at NCB Capital Markets, which is a regional uh, finance institution. So with that, I'll disappear off screen and ask our other speakers just to turn off their cameras again, and we'll ask Angus to say some introductory remarks. Thank you, uh, Angus Fry Dr. Angus Friday. Well, thank you very much, James, and uh, a very good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on, on where you are. Uh, my name is Angus Friday. I'm the Blue Economy Director at the Weight Institute, formerly uh, the Oceans representative at the World Bank. <clears throat> and as James mentioned, uh, I've had uh, different roles uh, serving Grenada as ambassador to the United Nations and the United States. Uh, at the Weight Institute, our focus is very much on the 30 by 30 objective. And uh, the Weight Institute is seeking to make a, a sizable contribution to that by working with countries uh, so that um, uh, cumulatively, we can set aside uh, up to 10 million square kilometers for this and for future generations. Uh, on behalf of the Weight Institute, we also just want to very quickly uh, express um, uh, uh, our thoughts uh, uh, to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, and to, to let anyone from uh, SVG to know that uh, you're very much uh, in, in our thoughts. What I'd like to do uh, is to start by setting the scene a little bit um, and before getting into uh, how uh, we're going to finance the blue and green recovery, I'd like to spend a, a little bit of time on the, the, on the, on the what, on the why and, and the what. Let's, let's just start with where we are right now, um, you know, as a Caribbean region. Well, for SIDS overall, uh, and in particular because of the high reliance on uh, tourism, SIDS have been the worst impacted um, by COVID from an economic standpoint, not necessarily from a health standpoint. Uh, and in the Caribbean in particular, uh, the anticipation of the OECD uh, was that um, and others were that uh, economies would contract anywhere between sort of uh, uh, six and, and 30 percent. And we've seen a, a lot of uh, contractions, you know, across, uh, uh, across the region. Where I want to end up in this conversation is not talking about all the difficulties, forces, and why it's difficult, but really to have a much more optimistic approach in some of the things we can get excited about and that we can do uh, as a region going forward. And I'm speaking on behalf, obviously, of the Weight Institute, but I also speak here uh, as a, a son of the Caribbean soil. So let's start with some of the why. What are some of the core issues? I think these are well documented already, our smallness, our vulnerability uh, to global shocks, the climate, to pandemics, all of these things are are well documented. The big problem that we see is this over-reliance on tourism. We saw it with 9-11. We saw it with the 2008 uh, financial crisis. 2017, after the uh, hurricane season that, that, uh, that, that we had that devastated the Caribbean, and we're seeing it uh, with the 2020 uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, as we said, this is having tremendous impacts uh, for SIDS and uh, across, across the region. We also have this high debt overhang, and that's a perennial issue uh, that, that we need to deal with. We have this reliance on uh, imported fossil fuel, which also needs to be tackled uh, uh, very, very, very seriously. So, what are some of the solutions to this? Firstly, in terms of dealing with our vulnerability right now, I think there's very much this focus on stimulus and recovery, blue and green recovery, a recovery that's resilient and inclusive, uh, one that's digital and fast. At the World Bank, uh, for those of you participating in the World Bank uh, uh, annual meetings, you know that the sort of green, resilient, and inclusive uh, recovery 
uh, was very much uh, uh, a key theme. Uh, we see here in the Caribbean that, um, you know, for example, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is really encouraging, amongst other things, uh, greater investment in a sort of digital uh, uh, recovery and the importance of that digital infrastructure <clears throat> uh, and its utility to the region as a whole, as we saw during the pandemic and as we can ex anticipate uh, going forward. In order for recovery to be fast, uh, we need to do a lot more to step up on vaccinations. When you look at where the Caribbean is on, on vaccinations compared to places like Seychelles and Bermuda, um, some of the recent data shows that uh, uh, Seychelles, for example, there are over 100 doses per 100 people. That's, of course, because uh, 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 some of these doses, uh, people have to get double doses. But even by the same measure, many of us in the Caribbean are way behind. And this is going to be an issue because places like uh, Seychelles can offer quarantine-free uh, 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 tourism uh, when we're not going to get into that space uh, just as yet. So to deal with over-reliance on tourism, a key thing we need to do is to diversify. We cannot emphasize this enough. In terms of when we want to think about what is it we're going to be financing, uh, we really need to understand uh, what are the opportunities? We need to move beyond the business as usual. Clearly, also, we need to go into areas where we can be, uh, where we can have global competitive advantage. One of the key areas, obviously, is going to be our blue economy. Why? Because so many of us have uh, ocean spaces and exclusive economic zones that are much larger than uh, our total, uh, our total landmass. So I'd like to start with the blue side and, the, uh, and dealing with the coast and, and ocean, ocean space. And under that, I'd like to cover tourism, sustainable fisheries, coastal resilience, blue biotech, coastal and ocean risk insurance, and then uh, going to some of the, the, the green uh, things we need to be doing on the green side and, and digitization. Let's start with tourism. There's a key sense that uh, we need to do a lot more to move towards long-stay tourism, that uh, the market is moving away from short-stay tourism uh, models. We see already that in, you know, in one study of a country of 19 countries offering digital nomad visas, Antigua and Barbados are actually listed as the lead countries. And this is you know, with a range of other countries from Dubai to Estonia and, uh, and other places. So I think, you know, well done Caribbean, well done Barbados in particular for recognizing this opportunity and moving quite, quite quickly. With tourism, we also need to be looking more and more at health and wellness uh, as an opportunity. In the Caribbean, we have a tremendous amount of offshore, what people call offshore medical schools. In the case of Grenada, it accounts for about 20% uh, of our GDP. What we haven't done, I think, as a region is to concentrically diversify around that. The issue with preclinical training, as we've seen with COVID, of course, is that uh, this type of training can be done online. So we need to diversify that uh, move to, towards on the clinical side uh, uh, and to parlay that into medical tourism. Uh, 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 it'll provide actually the, the infrastructure for medical and wellness tourism. On sustainable fisheries, uh, again, we need to look at the regional approach that has been taken by the Pacific. In the Pacific, you've got the parties to the Noru Agreement, which has been called the OPEC of fisheries. They have something called the Vessel Day Scheme that allows them to charge between uh, $8,000 and $15,000 per vessel per day operating uh, uh, in that space. It's very important that we come together, I think, regionally uh, and create an investment opportunity uh, uh, around that and use that regional approach uh, for the science, for the administration, and for the enforcement. And if we can get that right, uh, perhaps we can even have a joined up approach to the cruise ship industry uh, and to derive revenues, uh, better revenues from the cruise ship industry. Aquaculture and mariculture, obviously, other important um, uh, investment opportunities. 
Coastal resilience is needed right now more than ever, particularly for uh, job rich recovery. There's a lot we can be doing on mangroves and uh, tying that to, to, to blue carbon. Uh, you know, and, and, and the opportunity is now more than ever. You know, um, governments are, uh, are hungry for opportunities that uh, could ensure that people get uh, uh, hired and that it's, it's job rich. And I think also philanthropies are, are more and more looking into this space. And so making that connection between philanthropic funding, uh, uh, what governments would like to do, government policy, and working with multilateral development banks and others will be quite important in that space. And on coastal resilience, obviously, uh, uh, coral replanting is, is going to be hugely important. Coral is going to be a, a major uh, sought after product in, in, in years to come. And this leads to blue biotech. Uh, many people don't know, but uh, AZT, the first successful treatment for um, HIV AIDS, actually comes from a Jamaican uh, sea sponge. And so we shouldn't be looking at blue biotech as something that's outside of our reach, but rather we need to put in place right now some of the, the, uh, uh, the fundamentals and the infrastructure that can move us towards this, starting with corals and mangroves, moving into food, nutrition, and onto biopharmaceuticals. Let me just say something about ocean risk, uh, uh, ocean and coastal risk and insurance. Obviously, uh, the Caribbean is an, an area um, with a high level of risk. We see countries like Bermuda are already meccas uh, globally uh, for the risk industry. And so it wouldn't take a huge amount. The Caribbean already led on things on the Caribbean um, Catastrophic Risk Insurance Fund. It would not take a lot to begin to see the region actually as a new destination for an entire industry. Uh, ocean, and, ocean energy, I think, is well documented in, in many places. Uh, we have, we're spending a lot of money at the moment on, uh, on imported fossil fuel. We need to be looking at solar PV combined with battery storage, uh, offshore wind, geothermal, and having an accelerated uh, uh, electric vehicle program, which is actually going to help drive demand for renewable energy, which is actually going to help to, to, to pay for this. All of this would be aided hugely by a digital approach, a digital infrastructure, having more uh, digitization in schools, having innovation hubs, and moving to, to digital cash. So I've covered so far the why and the what. I'd now like to speak uh, very briefly to the how. The first thing starts, we believe, with mindset. Uh, it's a, a mindset that we can transform the Caribbean region uh, to one that is first world in a number of key selected uh, uh, in industries. Many of you may have seen the pivot video by Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Motley, and I think that really points the way forward by showing uh, what can be done in the region and how we need to be thinking about our future. IDB also did an excellent video called Jump uh, Caribbean. And uh, if you follow the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, I think a lot of the ideas that they're coming up with really points to this future of uh, a Caribbean that is embracing technology. So starting with that mindset is key. The stimulus governments are spending, uh, and James, I'm wrapping up now, uh, governments are spending uh, money on uh, clearly on, on, on stimulus. It needs to be green, blue, and job rich. The fiscal laws are vital, and now more than ever, because people need that fiscal space. Contingency funds, innovation funds tied to citizenship by investment programs, and uh, some of the innovative instruments such as blue bonds, green bonds, debt for nature swaps, doing that regionally would be hugely important. Finally, the World Bank has uh, IDA program, and this is a great opportunity actually to bring in things like philanthropic fun funding uh, to, to provide what's called the prior actions uh, for things like IDA funding. So where a small amount of uh, uh, philanthropic funding you know, in, in, the, in the units of millions can actually leverage tens of millions from uh, the multilateral development banks. So just in summary, uh, we have a range of problems. It's vital that we direct the stimulus funding um, very carefully, we need to diversify, we need to organize ourselves from a point of view of the mindset 
and the financial architecture that we put in place. James, uh, just want to give a big shout out to Island Innovation, the great job you guys are doing um, and very much appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Friday. And it's a real pleasure to have you join us and, and share some of those um, ideas. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you also as we move uh, forward. So for our next speaker, I'd like to go to the multilateral perspective. We have uh, Christian Peter, who's a practice manager for the environment, natural resources, and blue economy uh, at the World Bank. So Christian, where, where are you joining us from? You're in DC? Yes, I'm in DC. Great. Well, thank you for being here and uh, over to you for your remarks. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me, James. And um, I'm thanking everybody um, to, to, to this opportunity. I, I, and I want to, prior, prior to, to, to making my intervention, I also want to really express our deep um, thoughts with the, the, with the current developments in, in, um, in St. Vincent and um, our, our thoughts are with the um, people they are affected. And we hope that um, this can actually be something which, which will develop or which, will, 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 which we can address together and it can really um, be a possibility. Um, what I wanted to actually talk about, and I have to say that Angus um, really sort of caught or brought in much of what I wanted to say, um, it's really important because as we are moving forward in um, addressing a not a not an emergency response but really into a recovery response post COVID, we really need to take into consideration much of what um, Angus has said, particularly um, if we are looking at the blue economy as a sustainable and integrated development of of all economic sectors to consider oceans as the real basis for anything we have been, um, what, what the opportunities are actually providing to us. I think a blue economy approach, as we see it in the bank, drives growth, creates livelihood and jobs, helps strengthen food security, at the same time protecting natural capital and managing marine pollution and trade-offs among the different ocean sectors, which I do think is a very important point to consider. From our perspective, and I think what, what um, just sort of to highlight the situation, I know that my colleague um, Valerie Hickey, who is the practice manager um, in, 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 the, in the LAC region, um, she has just informed me that they're currently, at the, as we speak together with the Minister of St. Vincent and Grenadines, um, to discussing um, a support package which can be provided um, by the bank, but at the same time, we have what we call the catastrophic drawdown option, which is sort of um, a line of credit which, which had been in place and it has been dispersed. I'm not sure exactly about the amount, but it is a, um, 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 a product which the bank has, which actually can help very, um, very quickly to support cash or to inject cash into the, the recovery uh, mechanism and help um, to address the situation, at least in the short term, which is currently happening there. Going forward, I think it is important to also consider that we have now in the World Bank um, oceans of portfolio, which is about $5 billion in active projects. And the projects range from implementing large regional fisheries programs, such as in Africa and the Pacific, but also to tackling marine pollution including marine plastics, protecting critical marine habitats and supporting coastal development and the tourism, sustainable tourism, which Angus has been um, talking about. So as we are moving into a transition of a more blue economy um, over the past three years, we have been um, project, we have, we have new projects in the pipeline of about $4 billion worldwide in the World Bank. And for us in the Caribbean in particular, we have identified and support the need for a regional approach for SITS, pretty much in line with what Dr. Friday was, was talking about, um, that, that we really use the opportunity of um, combining um, different products and financing packages 
with the needs for a number of different countries at the same time. We have a program which is called um, Unleashing the Blue Economy for the Eastern Caribbean with Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which has about a $60 million project looking at the most important aspects of the ocean economy, including fisheries, solid waste measurement and tourism. Um, another area where I think we, we as a bank help to chart a new course was with, with the creation of COAST, which is a parametric insurance scheme for small scale fishermen at risk from extreme weather events. Um, and this program is still active in Grenada and St. Lucia. And I think what I would like to sort of wrap up in, in the, from the Berg's perspective is really, um, we have a, a recently Samuel report on marine plastics and weight management. Um, called not a minute to waste. So I, I encourage you to have a look at this. But how do we how do we go back forward with this and and sort of not to respond but also to sort of align a little bit of of what Angus was saying is um, that we see also as an institution that COVID nineteen has been a game changer for clients in the bank and the Caribbean in particular. Um, countries particular who have been reliant on marine industries like fisheries, like shipping and tourism are facing these significant challenges which have been outlined already. Maritime shipping has uh, dropped by 30%, fishing activity has decreased by as much as 80% and the impact on tourism globally um, but in particular on the, um, on, the, on the Caribbean has been tremendous. Um, so therefore we, we really are committed to help our Caribbean um, clients to rebuild their economies by putting as many people as possible back to work and as soon as possible. So as it was mentioned, the green, resilient, inclusive development, which, which has been um, a, a um, concept and approach which has been discussed at this recent spring meetings of the World Bank, is really trying to rebuild, rebuild better and bluer. And I do think that when we're talking blue, it is also sort of the green, but when you're talking green, it's also meant to be the blue. And so the green and blue recovery, they go hand in hand. And therefore we, we are encouraging our clients to follow this path on a blue economy transition, which I mentioned earlier. So in this regard, we, we recognize three essential components on the blue economy. First is the individual um, oceanic sectors need to perform better and in the more sustainable way and greater regard for preserving the ocean health, but at the same time also be inclusive. SITS and other countries can also consider ways to achieve greater integration between these various um, sectors. And then we need to work together to and identify not only new financing streams to support this transition, but make better use of existing financing instruments. And I think that is a very important conversation which we're currently having. So therefore we're encouraging our client countries that are SITs and, and coastal low um, developed low develop countries to follow this path in this transition, fully implementing the blue economy approach, which requires scaling up the resources available and, um, and as, as it was said, I think um, we are now moving into a new negotiation on IDA, the concessional um, window for the World Bank, but also combining this with, with concessional trust funds, grants, and, and as Angus mentioned also, I think we need to look at new ways of philanthropical um, financing to, to also bring this and combine this. And I think we need to make sure that we're not looking at this in, in sequence or in parallel steps, but we're looking at a problem and really working together in this one and, and looking at the, at the broad range of different financing instruments, which, un, which Angus um, already mentioned. So in conclusion, whereas the challenges are daunting, I would like to reiterate that the bank's commitments in working with our um, Caribbean countries, the client countries, as they engage in the blue um, economy endeavor to rebuild their economies better and bluer. And I thank you for that, for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for that overview of the, the bank's perspective of this work. And it's exciting to hear some of those uh, developments. We'll now move on to 
MPC Capital. Um, Gosda Caruso is the head of banking and financing. Um, and particularly, I guess, you'll be talking to us about renewable energy, Gosda? Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. I will oh, can't, about can't green, green recovery parts. Uh, yeah. Do you, do you want to turn your camera on? Yeah, sorry. Um, there we go. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. It is nice to be together with you, uh, um, and especially in these uh, lockdown days, uh, this kind of virtual panels are much more uh, meritorious to provide us uh, such a great opportunity to keep the momentum in the Caribbean in spite of the current uh, slowdown in the global economy. Uh, today, I will be talking about what we are doing for green recovery and, and, and taking the opportunity to introduce my company, MPC Capital, and our investments and, and financing activities in the Caribbean. Uh, I am Gözde Kurusoy, uh, Director of Banking and Finance at MPC Capital, uh, which is an international and publicly listed investment manager with 6 billion USD of assets under management. Uh, as of today, MPC Capital has three main uh, focus segments, so which are shipping, real estate and infrastructure. Uh, under infrastructure segments, we have a team consisting of about uh, 20 uh, three people uh, located at um, Hamburg, Colombia and Panama offices. Uh, this team purely focus on uh, renewable energy investments. Um, actually, MPC uh, has been active in uh, renewable energy sector since 2007, but starting from uh, 2017, Latin America and the Caribbean started becoming a, a focus area of MPC. Therefore, uh, we set up a, a fund at the Mossad in Cayman named CCF, a Caribbean Clean Energy Fund. Uh, CCF uh, invested uh, in its uh, first seed assets in, in 2017, which is um, a 51 megawatt solar park in Jamaica. Um, and and, uh, and, and uh, following that, CCF acquired an operational wind farm in Costa Rica with a capacity of 21 megawatt in 2019 through a co-investment uh, with Anson Makal. I'm sure uh, many of you uh, know very well Anson Makal. Uh, and the third asset uh, of the CCF is six megawatt uh, solar park in El Salvador. Um, so. Uh, uh, which uh, had been initially acquired by MPC Capital uh, from a, a, a local developer at a very early uh, development stage, but then uh, fully developed by MPC and, and, and constructed under supervision of MPC. Um, after COD, the project uh, was, was uh, acquired by CCF. Um, yeah, in the agenda of CCF, in the current agenda of CCF, uh, there are some upcoming uh, upcoming investments. Uh, these are most likely be in the Dominican Republic and the Barbados, um, and we hope to finalize these uh, transactions um, of these deals by the end of this year. Um, in parallel, MPC Capital uh, recently launched a new investment vehicle named MPC Energy Solutions, uh, located in Netherlands. Uh, in the beginning of this year, MPC was listed, MPCS was uh, listed on Oslo Stock Exchange and has successfully uh, raised a total of uh, 100 million. Um, MPC ES has been pro uh, developing a wide pipeline consisting of solar, wind, uh, uh, hybrid, and energy uh, efficiency projects are located in a diversified set of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean countries. Uh, with MPC ES, we aim to attract more European investors and bring the capital to the Caribbean and make uh, low carbon energy infrastructure investment in the uh, region and contribute to energy transmission uh, of the countries and uh, lower the global carbon footprint. Uh, in regards 
uh, that financing of the investments, uh, we mainly uh, pay attention uh, to have a healthy mix uh, of international DFIs and the, and the local banks in our portfolio. Um, there are so many variable factors while we are making these selections, um, such as ticket size of the financing timeline, shareholder structure, and so on. But in general, uh, we find working with DFIs more challenging, demanding, and uh, comparing to local banks. But in the meantime, uh, it is very informative in, in, in many uh, aspects. So therefore, we do also believe um, uh, the experience, the know-how we have with the DFIs should be transmitted to the local banks in a way that to work more uh, with them on project financing. And, and, and to increase our local financing exposure in, in, in our portfolio. By doing this um, as an investor uh, in the very midterm, we believe that we will have much more variable options and, and, and very experienced local partners in project finance in the market. In that sense, uh, we truly believe that MPC is a great contributor to green recovery of a Caribbean directly through our renewable energy investments, but also indirectly by creating impact uh, on the society and the collaboration um, that we make uh, with the local stakeholders and the financing partners. Um, this is, in a nutshell, who we are. Um, yeah, again, I would like to thank you uh, for having me uh, and, and provide uh, such a good opportunity to introduce MPC and our activities in the uh, in, in the Caribbean. Um, it was a pleasure for me uh, to meet you all virtually, and hopefully one day um, we can meet in person as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gosda, for that important uh, angle in the discussion. Um, we'll now move on to our final uh, speaker, uh, Timar Jackson, Manager of um, Origination Structuring at NTB Capital Markets. And we're really glad uh, to have NTB involved throughout uh, this event, um, as I know that although uh, you are perhaps a more traditional in certain aspects financial organization. You're really looking at innovative aspects of introducing um, some of these these elements and working across the whole region. So great, we can see your screen and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, NCB Capital Markets and myself are, are well pleased to be a part of this forum and actually being a part of this conversation, which we deem to be very important. And we look forward very much to, you know, learning from all the experts that are on the, the, the various panels, as much as we, we intend to, to share our perspective um, to, 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 to create a, a, a greener, cleaner future for everyone. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about NCB Capital Markets, we are a regional um, investment banking outfit, uh, regional in the sense that we cover the Caribbean pretty much. And we we, we have very deep um, ex experience and expertise in, in, in various types of capital market um, structuring and transactions. Um, so that is, that is where I think we, we, we really have a competitive advantage as an entity. Um, and we definitely look forward as well to, to, to working with anyone who you know is looking to enter you know the market here in the region and and seek and, and is seeking a financing partner. For the next five to six minutes, I'm going to outline some of the unique opportunities and challenges faced by us as small island states um, and address why we need the blue recovery and suggest some practical ways that stakeholders, including the private sector, public sector, multilaterals, um, can work together to ensure a greener, cleaner, more inclusive and resilient um, future. 
So I, I think Dr. Angus would have sort of covered a lot of these issues that, that, that we in the Caribbean face. But the key point I want to make here is that um, COVID-19 uh, has had a, a disproportionate impact on, on, on our region, and in particular because of some of the many um, vulnerabilities that our economies face. Um, we see where, for example, uh, our region would have generally declined by about 9.4% in terms of GDP, while uh, more developed countries such as the US and so on would have declined by only 8%. Right. Um, in addition to that, we have emerging market countries declining by less because when you consider uh, countries such as China and India, they didn't decline as much. So with the impact of COVID-19, uh, governments now have the challenge of trying to balance um, a number of things. They're trying to, to balance, you know, deploying their funds um to to meet the immediate needs right and and that is um you know emergency financing and so on but then they also need to deal with the fact that we are vulnerable states and and would have highlighted some of those vulnerabilities and a lot of them sort are related to you know the climate the climate change uh which is a very important topic at this moment it's also related to how we manage our, our, our ecosystems, um, natural ecosystems and so on. And also um, dealing with the fact that, you know, there are risks that are inherent in any type of project that, that has to do with the blue or the green economy, right? And, and, and sort of trying to mitigate those risks is also an important priority. So, what, what exactly are the opportunities that exist in the in, in, in terms of blue or uh, green recovery? So placing a green recovery at the core of all economic strategies is increasingly seen by um, you know countries the world over um, as an opportunity for us to have a greener, cleaner, and more inclusive and resilient future. Green in this context pretty much encompass a number of elements, including sustainability, natural resources, climate resilience, as well as inclusiveness for all sections of, of society. So when we talk about green um, and the green recovery, we are also talking about the role of the blue economy in the process, because as Dr. Angus would have mentioned, earlier they, they 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 both go hand in hand or it was christian <laughs> i believe who mentioned that they both go hand in hand so you can't talk about one without talking about the other right when done well adapting and building resilience to climate change can generate significant economic benefits um and we have some 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 information here based on research according to the global commission on the economy and climate, strong climate action could generate over 65 million new carb, low carbon jobs by 2030. It could also deliver at least 26 trillion in net global economic benefits and avoid over 700,000 premature deaths from air pollution. So the benefits there are, are, are compelling. We also have information from a global commission on adaptation they estimated that investing 1.8 trillion globally um, from 2020 to 2030 in resilience could generate 7.1 trillion in benefits. So if you're talking about dollars and cents, then this green recovery, blue recovery does make sense. According to the Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and, and uh, Environment, Green construction projects can deliver higher multipliers in terms of um, engagement of labor and so on, because it's a lot, they tend to be a lot more labor intensive. In addition to that, a one million spending um, on, 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 on projects in the green space will generate 7.49 full-time jobs in renewable infrastructure, 7.72 in energy efficiency, 
versus 2.65 in fossil fuels. So if persons are concerned about the economics of, of going green and blue, you can say that the, the, the economics does make sense for us to pursue this part. Um, a lot of a number of the other panelists would have mentioned the fact that in, 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 in our region, the blue economy is very important. And the statistics here say that 80% of CARICOM member states territories um, is accounted for by water, by the ocean, right? So when we're thinking about our economy, we no longer need to look just inland. We have a wider ecosystem out there that we can tap into for various reasons, and there's a lot of value there. The estimates here are that the ocean economy contributes about 1.5 trillion in value added to the global economy, and this is expected to double by 2030. So why do we need to pursue a blue-green recovery? I think um, the, the, the case was made from the previous slide, but I want to start to highlight a, a few things here. We need to generate more jobs to take more persons out of poverty. We need to accelerate climate resilience because that is a major threat to, to, to our economy and, 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 and um, that is one of the major sources of vulnerabilities. We need to also protect the environment and natural capital. So this includes our blue economy, uh, the, the oceans and so on. We need to make sure that these continue to, to, to be sustainable and resilient to whatever um, we're doing. So I want to close out by sort of talking about some of the considerations for financing the blue green recovery, right? Um, first of all, we need to note that innovation in terms of structuring the finance will be very, very critical. The green Blue asset class is not one that is very familiar. It's not mainstream as yet. And the truth is that we can extract a lot more value from it if we make it mainstream, right? But persons need to become uh, more familiar with it. And, and with that, uh, we, I believe there will be more innovation and there will be more success in terms of these um, blue projects and so on, um, you know, going through, being accepted. Um, development of proper frameworks and risk assessment need to be put in place. Um, so a big part of the challenge right now is that some of these projects might not make it through the process because, you know, they are not well understood. They don't, with banks and financial institutions don't have the right mechanisms, the right frameworks for assessing the risks that are involved. We need to also, uh, uh, along with that, deepen analyst appreciation of the asset class. And there are a number of programs out there now. The CFA Institute recently started their EESG program where analysts can get themselves um, familiar with, with doing the relevant assessment for this asset class. There, there, there's actually a global compact among um, professional financial institutions um, that has to do with ensuring that ESG and, and the priorities around that become mainstream in all considerations related to finance. Um, it will require a multi-stakeholder approach and governments and multilateral um, guarantees may be required to de-risk projects and lower the cost of funds. Um, so far, there has been success in terms of green bonds and so on. Um, issuers, governments and, and private institutions have been able to issue at lower rates because of actually being able to innovate and finding ways that help to, 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 to sort of make investors a lot more comfortable and thereby reduce the cost of funds. You know, so this is a great opportunity here for issuers to actually infuse more ESG type um you know, considerations in the type of financing that they're seeking. For example, you, 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 you want lower rate, you could say, okay, well, if I'm, a, if I'm a company that's in the energy sector and I use mostly oil and gas, I could start a target a certain um, proportion of renewable by a certain time, and that could help me to reduce my risk premium Thanks. over time. Thanks, Tim. I want to make sure we have time for Q&A, <laughs> if you don't mind wrapping up. Yes, um, 
And, and finally, um, inclusion of ESG-based conditionalities in, in, in the process. I mean, overall, what, what we need really is, is for us to um, shift the mindset around the asset class, become more fa familiar with it, put the relevant systems in place and so on. To, to, to make it one that is more mainstream. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this forum. And we congratulate um, Island Innovation for the work that they're doing um, in terms of, you know, making these relevant topics, uh, putting them out there uh, for discussion and consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much for that overview. From NCB and uh, it's great to hear about some of the priorities that you're currently uh, working on. I invite all of our other panelists to come back on camera if they would like and uh, I can see a few questions uh, coming back in. Um, so you know this is maybe a broader one is a, is a good one to start. The specific question is other than traditional project finance sources, what are the key sources of blue-green recovery capital targeting slow, uh, solely global island communities? And I guess I'll broaden that out as well because with one of my own questions, um, which was also about the new mechanisms you see. So philanthropy was talked about as one possible uh, mechanism for, for example, the blue economy. Um, there's been talk of public-private partnerships uh, for, for, for a long time, although um, there's, uh, some countries have, have pursued those uh, more than others, um, and um, other financial mechanisms. I know, I know we have some attendees who may want to add in their own thoughts in the chat about other financial mechanisms that have come in. So would anyone like to start off with your comments on that? or specific specific financial mechanisms that you see that are particularly promising in the areas that you're you're working in <laughs> well in 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 that case i guess we can oh christian were you going to say something <laughs> no i mean i would have let Angus start because he had this the, the idea of the of the philosophy and and sort of how to come the pull these different things together but but as I said I mean as, as a global institution we don't really have sort of very specific for for a certain area what we're what we're really trying to do is to to sort of pull together the experiences from from other areas um, but at the same time also in the current discussions on um, on, on sort of the the new financing, we're also looking at how can we combine um, sort of new financing, new debt countries will definitely take on, um, consider in these in this in this new um, in this new financing new debt, um, what countries can bring in terms of the benefits from climate and um, the benefits and the risks from climate and biodiversity so that um, if a country really can contribute or really is at a, at a high risk that this will be taken into account and help to combine different financing to bring down the borrowing cost for this new financing so that that's one of the ideas which we have been bouncing around within within the bank with a couple of other other players as well um, to really ensure that we are as, as in a recent conversation, the chief economist of the bank has has said is that the program is the, the problem is so big that we can't leave out any any opportunity of any idea is not as crazy as it may be sound in really to come come to the table and look at it and really make sure that it is considered because it actually could could help um, bringing down the cost of borrowing for some of these most affected countries. And I know that one of the key issues which we've kind of included across this forum is the issue of scale for many islands, um, particularly the smaller countries that may have populations 100, 200, even half a million. Um, the, the scale of the funds available, um, and I saw someone has mentioned the Green Climate Fund, and I know this was a criticism that was often levied against them, just means that it, it, it can be quite difficult for 
many island governments to um, access and if it, it, for, for non-SIDS islands it may just be that the scale of projects are not large enough to get those accessible elements so I think that's the important one. Ang Angus would you like to come in on some? Uh, yeah no just ju just just to say that um, uh, you know I, I, I think the you know the situation that we, we find ourselves in now you know it's you know we need all hands on deck uh, people need to be working together and so uh, we need to find ways of of scaling up. Um, you know, I think you know everyone's interested in in having a job rich recovery, uh, having as many people as possible. You know, get involved with things like you know mangrove replanting, um, uh, you know car replanting, things that can actually help to generate jobs, uh, offset job losses from the tourism sector. Uh, uh, and a lot of these things, as I mentioned earlier, uh, could be looked at as what's called prior actions in the context of uh, 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 development uh, policy uh, uh, credits uh, uh, under IDA, um, where uh, some of these actions um, can be formalized uh, you know, within a formal program and could help trigger um, you know, budgetary support um, you know, from from either. So, and, and you know, so so this is a, a case where you can actually use you know very small amounts of funding actually to leverage much larger amounts of funding. And and you know, we've actually done that in Grenada. Uh, we um, in my previous role um, with something called the uh, first fiscal resilience and blue growth uh, development policy credit under <laughs> um, Ida. So. You know there is experience there that that can be built on. Uh, just one other thing to say, uh, James, is that you know um, the debt overhang, um, you know, for, for the region is 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 also an issue, and we have an opportunity now, um, you know, to look at uh, job-rich blue-green uh, recovery um, for countries that may have looked at the the, the debt swap in the past. Um, you know, may, may not have been comfortable, um, but I think with high levels of debt and the need for stimulus, um, uh, you know, this is perhaps one of those um, opportunities, one of these times to, to you know, to, to look at it more closely. Uh, there have been uh, writings by the um, OECD and others, uh, you know, to see whether this can is something that can be done uh, on a regional scale. And uh, you know now would be the time to you know to to, to pursue some of these things. Um, one of the things mentioned earlier was the challenge we have in the Caribbean with very small deals, and this is why you know people like you know Raquel Moses and others uh, set up the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator to help you know with this whole issue of how do you aggregate small demand um, and. Uh, 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 you know, to, to make it attractive to you know to external parties. So these are some of the innovations we're seeing in the in the Caribbean, and we we probably need to make more use, um, you know, great, greater use of them. Have a greater appreciation, I think, uh, of what's happening, and and make greater use of them. Thank you, Angus. I, I'm just looking at some of the comments, and there's um, one interesting comment from. Rongvaldo Goodmanson joining us from the Arctic. Isn't it necessary to start stressing more than social aspects of sustainability? We're used to look at environment and economy, but less the social aspects. And I think that's worth pointing out that often this idea of the blue economy is just that. It's managing um, obviously the economy, but with conservation and with the, the social aspects. And definitely at Island Innovation, when we use sustainable development as a frame, we see it very much at those three pillars of society, environment, and um, economy. There's also quite a few specific questions coming in. So panelists, feel free to look down those. And if there's any specific ones that you want to ad ad address, a question um, from Dr. Francesco Sindico about the Green Climate Fund, which we touched on briefly, but also questions coming in about power and water infrastructure, um, conservation projects, um, low carbon transport and internet connectivity. So we can't we can't cover all of those. They're, they're, this is quite a broad panel, but we will ask panelists to, um, uh, to we will ask uh, participants when we go to the tables in a few minutes to uh, 
talk about some of these specific issues according to the interest on your your table. Um, Gazda, is there anything uh, that you'd like to, to comment? Yeah, actually, uh, I will not be able to join the t uh, round tables, so, but uh, I would like to answer uh, the, uh, the question uh, uh, from Adam. So, unfortunately, green, tr green transportation is out of uh, expertness of, of both uh, CCF and MPC. Uh, we are limitedly touching the green demand side uh, through our uh, energy efficiency investments. But um, as I said, so we are uh, more into uh, green energy supply side. Okay, great. And Timar, is there anything that you'd like to come in on? Um, sure. Uh, so, so, so just to backtrack a bit to that first question um, about what small island, what models can work for small island um, states. Uh, I think one in which one of the key problems we had have of course is the cost of, of, of funds um, or governments whenever they go to the, the capital markets so the local or international tend to pay a high premium um, for, for, for whatever debt that they're raising um, as we would have noted earlier um, a lot of these countries are still um, I mean even worsened by COVID, they're still suffering from, from significant debt, debt loads, right? Um, Jamaica, for example, made, made some really good strides in terms of bringing down their debt to below 100% of, of, of GDP. But uh, because of COVID-19 and the required response, they have had to sort of, um, you know, take on, take on some more. The, the, the key thing I think here is for, for us to look at um, the way that we, we finance these governments. You know, um, I think there's um, a readiness to, to sort of provide grants, you know, um, to, to sort of deal with these temporary shifts. But given the long term nature of, of what we're talking about in terms of the blue green recovery, uh, we'll have to look at um, longer term financing and financing that is a lot cheaper than we're able to get to the traditional capital markets. And as I mentioned before, it may require um, more guarantee type structures, you know, to, to actually make it work for these countries. So much uh, for that. And I can see um, some more interesting um, comments coming in. Pep Badi uh, just asked about um, MPC's activities in the DR and Barbados and looking at aggregation. Um, I don't know if there's anything there, Gosta, that you can add about this opportunity to aggregate between multiple multiple markets or, or comment on those. Um, so um, as explained, uh, in the upcoming days, uh, um, we will be more active in, in, in the DR and the Barbados as well. So uh, the technology um, is going to be solar um, in, in these deals. Um, and um, mainly we are focused on the infrastructure. So um, aggregation is also out of scope of, of our, our, our funds. Um, so I'm happy to um, have more detailed conversation about our activities um, in the in the roundtable. So I will be just uh, joining for uh, 15 minutes then, and uh, I, I will be happy to uh, inform you about all our activities in, in the Caribbean. Thanks so much. And I just wanted to pick up two quick points, and then I'll ask for any final final comments um, that the speakers would like to to address or, or add um, because our questions are quite ranging which is I guess what we get for having a broad broad discussion um, we do have two discussions so looking at Jade Hutchinson's remark about the private sector initiatives uh, we do actually have a discussion after this later on today uh, which will be about funding for small and medium enterprises and again I think on particularly for smaller countries, these small businesses, uh, it's really important to think about business on that scale and the role that those have in addition to the private banks. Um, and in, in the comment about the broader um, debt issue, one of our strategic partners for this event is the Alliance of Small Island States. Um, and there'll be a specific session that is addressing um, small island developing states and access to capital and debt later on this week. So we'll be going into some deep dives onto those 
uh, topics as well. So final remarks from any of the panelists before we go into our roundtables and, and uh, discussions? Well, uh, if, if I may, James, you know, just to say that, uh, you, you know, we've, we've, we've been here before uh, in terms of, you know, large scale global impacts um, that have really stymied, uh, you know, the, the, the Caribbean. So uh, it, I think it's absolutely vital that, you know, as, as a region, we sort of address uh, some of these sort of deep structural issues, particularly, um, you know, over reliance on, on one or two industries by putting some focus on diversification and uh, really a tremendous amount of focus, I think, on, uh, you know, on the blue economy. P part of the, um, a few of the islands have started um, putting in place uh, blue economy ministries, I think, which is quite important as a, as, as a first start, but perhaps we need to see, you know, much more of that and, 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 and more focus on diversification. Obviously, building resilience, particularly using ecosystems, is just a great way of, uh, you know, of, of ensuring that you have a recovery that um, has economic benefits, um, has environmental benefits, and the social benefits um, that, that that, that was spoken about. Uh, finally, um, let us never uh, unders underscore. Um, the, let, let us never underestimate the importance of looking at the digital um, approaches. The whole issue of small scale and, and the need for aggregation. You have um, organizations like Kiva.org. Uh, they're doing many, many uh, so small uh, lending to small businesses uh, all over the world. Um, you know, uh, uh, rapid transactions happening. Um, uh, you know, in a, in a very short space of time, and and this is all made possible on the digital platform. So we can bring the small scale of some of the challenges we have and some of the, the actors by aggregating this, um, you know, through a digital platform, uh, you know, which, which would allow funders uh, to be able to see, um, uh, you know, some level of scale. So I, th I think this would be one of the, the things to, uh, you know, to, to give some thought to, particularly for small islands. Thank you. Good Friday. Just, just also to to underline some of which was has said before is is the, the whole issue of scale. I think also the the Caribbean has has a long history of very well established regional collaboration and coordination mechanisms that that also address transboundary issues. And I think that is something which is a a, a real sort of capital somebody has to bring to the table and sort of saying, look, we can. If there is, a, is an issue of scale, we can actually do this together. And we have a, a history of, of working in regional projects and working together and, and really being in the, in the position to, to bring this to the table. And the second point, coming on, um, following on, on the, the point made by Angus regarding the ecosystem um, recovery is also to know what are the benefits, to really have a clear understanding of what are the benefits of these of these vast um, ecosystems, which still are relatively healthy in terms of coastal and marine resources, and really bring this to the table and sort of saying this is something which 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 really helps us to to um, to de-risk some of these investments because we can bring this to the table, and 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 this is something which I think we would need to help to 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 these these countries to to. Sort of negotiate in a in a much more sophisticated way because of the valuation we can bring to to these uh, or we know of and we can bring to the table so that that this is something which um, is put um, as as an not, it's not a capital but it's it's sort of the natural capital I think has not been taken into consideration sufficiently in these negotiation and I do think that this is this is something where we have enough data we have this collaboration which really can can make it make a difference thanks Tima any final words from you so I mean yeah sure what I would say is that uh, 
quarantine has really given us a unique opportunity to, to, to you know, really consider some of the, the challenges that we've faced um, and how what we've been doing, the, the business models that, that we've been operating, the way we allocate capital in the past and so on, has brought us to this point, right? Um, research shows that if we continue as we did before, we'll pretty much see a lot more you know, coronavirus type pandemics um, coming to our shores. And not only that, we'll also have other um, climate related challenges um, to come in the future. We have to be smart about how we recover, you know, um, and be practical as well. You know, the, 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 the evidence shows that, you know, if it is that we pursue um, that sort of that blue green recovery, there's a, there's a vast amount of opportunity that, that, that's there that's unexplored and will generate a lot of value for business, right? But in addition to that, it balances um, also the fact that we need to operate more sustainably, we need to protect our environment, and we need to also protect jobs and, and ensure that people are, 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 are taken care of um, socially. So the solution, which the, 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 the going green and, and focusing on the blue economy for this recovery will ensure that we achieve those, but also promise to, to generate new sources of income for the future. Mm -hmm. And we just had a question come in. Perhaps you can answer this in the in the chat, Tima, uh, from Diane Edwards, asking if you know of any uh, specific green or blue uh, funds that, that uh, NCB is exploring. I know, I, I don't know of any regional banks in the Caribbean that are doing that. I've, I've heard some large international banks looking into that, uh, but if you want to answer that in the, in the chat. Uh, Gosda, final, final comments from MPC? Um, actually, it was very nice to talk about in recovery uh, and blue and, and recovery uh, of the Caribbean region. Uh, so, um, so as as MPC, we are trying to do our best uh, to 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 contribute this recovery. Um, and we will be more active in the region, so uh, we will be looking forward to have uh, all these um, improvements in in in, in the uh, region. Uh, and then we will be uh, trying to play a vital role in the in in the um, country, uh, the region. I hope uh, we will be uh, more in touch uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, we will be uh, more um, in, in in touch. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for setting the stage. We're now going to move to the interactive part. Um, so I would encourage you all to stay around for an opportunity to talk and, and share your own thoughts and ideas. Um, the next 30 minutes or so will go into the table mode. So you'll be in small groups of five to six people. There'll be an opportunity to introduce yourself to the other participants at your table. Feel free to, to move to a table that represents your interest, but um, it might be a bit random of who else is, who else is there on that table. Um, and we'll ask each table to propose um, on a very high level what they see as the biggest opportunity. So Dr. Friday mentioned at the start we were talking about opportunities as we tend to know what the problems are. Uh, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for finance in the region? Whether that is um, ideas such as uh, involving the private sector in certain ways, public-private partnerships, philanthropy was mentioned, or other finance mechanisms. Um, not just limited to finance mechanisms, it could be other aspects of the blue economy, green energy, or, or, or the recovery. Um, and so in about 30 minutes, we'll bring you back. We'd ask that each table, after introducing yourself, shares in one or two sentences what they see as a, a, a key solution and that when, uh, when those ideas are shared, um, we will ask someone 
to come up and and speak a little bit just to explain in a couple of minutes about that so do be, be prepared if you put down an idea to come up onto the stage all participants will actually vote on which one we invite people up to the stage for um, if you have any technical issues, any questions, feel free to send uh, a message to myself or Isabel Godoy from Island Innovation, who is helping uh, with the assistance. And we will come back into the presentation mode in about 30 minutes. So thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you again to our speakers and hope we can have a good discussion and talk about what the big solutions for the region are. We'll go back to the tables.